Kalodibri. The Grimsvötn volcano in Iceland is back again to receive its yearly spotlight as in the last few days quite a lot has happened there. This activity consists of large earthquakes and a glacial flood or Jökulhlaup. News of Asgia reveal that uplift is still ongoing albeit at a much slower rate. The Reykjanes Peninsula is of course still in full swing, where uplift continues. Earthquake monitoring has been difficult in the past couple of days, as the weather in Iceland has been horrible, but it should clear up on Friday. A devastating event occurred in the town of Grindavík yesterday, where a man is believed to have fallen into one of the crevices that formed on November 10th. Rescue teams are working hard to try and find him, but the weather conditions have not helped. A lift has been set up that rescuers use to go down into the crevice two at a time. This rescue operation is really challenging as the rescue teams have to make everything safe and they're also having to expand the crevice so the lift fits. This really struck the people of Grindavík and also the whole of Iceland. Hopefully everything goes well and they find the man soon. Does this recent activity in Grimsvatn suggest an eruption is imminent? Could we be about to witness two volcanoes in Iceland erupting at the same time? Is another system on the Reykjanes Peninsula about to erupt? Well, let's check out the details. Beginning with Grimsvatn. On January 4th, a strange earthquake swarm was detected that originated from Grimsvatn which resulted in an raised aviation color code for the volcano. It was definitely something out of the ordinary, but didn't last long, and the aviation color code was lowered back down from yellow to green. Then, a week later, the biggest earthquake in Grimsvatn since measurements began struck, a magnitude 4.3. This was definitely an indication that something was going on and there is pretty much only one option. Jökulhlaup A Jökulhlaup, or glacial flood, are a common occurrence in Grimsvatn, with this being the third one since 2021. As this volcano is covered by a thick glacier, the geothermal activity resulted by the volcano melts the ice which fills up a bowl. When the bowl is full, pressure builds up which eventually opens up a path for water to flow out. The water then follows existing paths where glacial rivers originate from, which increases their discharge by a lot. The river that gets this discharge buff from Grimsvatn is called Gígukvísl, and normally has a discharge of 100 cubic meters per second. Last time, back in October of 2022, we had a small Jökulhlaup, which increased the discharge to 500 cubic meters per second. In 2021, the discharge peaked at 3000 cubic meters per second. Yep, that's an increase. So, are we dealing with a Jökulhlaup now? Yes, no question. Our experts report that they're detecting tremors caused by the flow of a lot of water and an obvious increase in water levels in the Gígukvist river are also visible on these images from the bridge which crosses the river. Based on the time since the last Jökulhlaup, it is estimated that the peak discharge in Gígukvist will be no more than 1000 cubic meters per second, but as a lot of equipment on Grímsfjall is in bad condition, it is hard to make an accurate prediction. Will this result in an eruption? A Jökulhlaup always has the possibility to trigger an eruption, as a lot of pressure is released off the volcano in a short amount of time, which makes it much easier for magma to reach the surface. It is, on the other hand, statistically more likely that we won't get an eruption, as there have only been three eruptions linked with a Jökulhlaup in the last 100 years out of 12 total eruptions. There's still one trick Grimsvatn has to increase its chance of erupting now. That is, it has been unusually long since its last eruption, 
or 12 years. In the last 100 years, Grimsvatn has on average erupted every 8 years. And the time since the last eruption is the third longest in these 100 years. Unfortunately, as always, the only way to tell if an eruption will occur is to wait and see what happens. So that is what we'll do. Now, on to the Reykjanes Peninsula. Not much has changed on the Reykjanes Peninsula since the last upload, other than uplift is at a different level. No significant change in earthquake activity has occurred yet, although we can't really see the smaller earthquakes currently due to weather, but as mentioned earlier, winds should calm down tomorrow on January 12th. It has now been long since the uplift passed the trigger height on the Schwarzengi GPS station. And as of the making of this video, uplift on the Eldwerp and Skipastigshraun GPS stations is about to reach the same heights it was at before the December 18th eruption. They're still pretty far off the heights seen there before the subsidence event on November 10th. As at this pace, it would take more than two weeks to climb the remaining 100 millimeters. The current situation in the Schwarzengi volcano system is really uncertain, but simulations done by our experts suggest that the volume of accumulated magma has already surpassed the numbers before the December 18th eruption. The longer we wait for an intrusion, the larger it'll be, so this is definitely nail-biting. Then there's Krisuvik, another system on the Reykjanes Peninsula. It got some attention after a recent earthquake swarm close to the system, although those earthquakes were classic pressure release quakes. The question is, were they caused by the activity to the west, which is Svartsengi and Fagradarsfjall, or Krisuvik itself? An interesting analysis done by a famous geoscientist, Haraldur, suggests that a large magma intrusion is present under the surface in the Krisuvik system, covering 50 to 100 square kilometers. That's up to 20,000 football fields. These insane numbers are not just drawn from someone's pockets. They do have some logic behind them. They analyzed the number of deep earthquakes from the Schwarzengi, Fagradalsfjall and Krisuvik system. There are two common types of earthquake waves, secondary and primary types, S and P for short. P-type waves basically travel through anything, solid rock, liquids like magma, and gases. Then there's the S-types. They're not as skilled, as they can only travel through solid rock. This allows for some interesting analysis when it comes to spotting magma underground, as the P-waves arrive first unhindered and fast, followed by the sluggish S-waves. Or what? Did the S-waves not arrive? That must mean there's something in the way, and underground, that something is most likely magma. This is exactly what's happening under Schwarzengi when looking at deeper earthquakes, below 6 kilometers, as the S-waves don't make it through the magma which is present there. The surprising thing is that this is also happening in the Krisuvik system, where earthquakes deeper than 6 kilometers are not a common sight. Then, in the Fagradalsfjall system, deep earthquakes are the thing. As we know there's magma under Schwarzengi, this suggests there's also magma under Krisuvik, since the data for the two systems look really similar. The size estimate of the intrusion is based on the area at which deep earthquakes aren't being detected, but I think the 50 to 100 square kilometer estimate is pretty dramatic. Does this mean an eruption in Krisuvik is likely? It is really hard to say. These analyses are cool, but could be biased. Maybe there just aren't any earthquakes at these depths under Krisuvik, and it is a bit strange that no visible earthquake activity or uplift has followed the formation of this massive intrusion. Unless it formed back in 2021, before the first eruption in Fagradarsfjall, and is dead. What do you guys think? On to Aska. There's not much to say other than there's still uplift being detected in Aska, according to scientists. 
But during the summer of 2023, it looked like it stalled. There hasn't been any interesting earthquake activity in the area in some time, but that could change. Now that was a lot of new data. I just want to thank everyone who made it here. Definitely leave any speculations and questions in the comments. It's always fun to read them. Other than that, I just hope you enjoyed, hope to see most of you in the next video, and thanks for watching.